Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear? Everyone in the back? All right, cool. Let's just do a quick level set. I want to get an idea of what everyone's skill set is. So who's familiar with pandas? Just quick. Oh, wow. Everybody OK? Scikit-learn. How about machine learning fundamentals like gradient descent, error metrics, things like that? All right. Cool. All right. So we're in good shape. All right. So yes, I will be talking to you today about rapid prototyping and data science with big data and Python. So a little bit about me and the company I work for. I am a real live data, da uh, sorry, senior data scientist. Um, I'm an instructor at Metis as well. So we have a couple different offerings. All we do is data science training. So we offer a, oops, sorry, full-time boot camp. It's a three-month boot camp, and that's what I teach. We have evening courses for people who want to learn a specific skill or just want to dabble, aren't ready for the, the full thing. Uh, we have online courses, same kind of setup and we do corporate training as well. So number of offerings. All right, so a couple key assumptions about this talk. Again, ideally you have some sort of machine learning experience and familiar, familiarity specifically with gradient descent. If you don't, that's okay. You'll still get a lot out of this talk, but there might be some uh, aspects of this pipeline that I talk about that might seem like magic, but don't worry, it's just math. All right, so I am gonna assume that you're familiar with Scikit and Pandas, so when I get to my code, you'll see that this looks exactly like the stuff that you've seen and modeled with. And we're gonna assume that all prototyping from beginning to end is done with this thing called the Pi data stack. So this is your typical NumPy, Pandas, SciPy, Scikit-learn. All right, so I wanna parse this title up a little bit. Let's talk about this thing called rapid prototyping. So basically, the process always starts the same way. I have some sort of problem I'm trying to solve. I generate some ideas, and then, you know, we're all here. We all need to build some sort of prototype, some sort of software to answer that question. Well, this can be very difficult in data science because, um, you know, we don't always know the right solution. So it's sort of this iterative process. So we build our first prototype. We create some sort of metrics or constraints to test it with, and then we analyze those metrics and we say, did we answer the problem or did we not? And then usually that leads to some sort of refinement. So again, rarely do we get that on the first go. This leads to new ideas. We build another prototype, and we do this as rapidly as we can. We don't want anything to bog down our process. All right, so this idea of data science, how do we apply it to this rapid prototyping scheme? First question is always, you know, what is the problem? In this case, it might be we are some sort of online advertiser, and up to this point, we've been showing everyone the same ad. Well, we have this hypothesis that if we can segment markets and we show them a targeted ad, we'll get a better response rate. So what we do is we collect some data. Maybe what age group are these people? What are their interests? You know, do they like cars or are they into, uh, I don't know, outdoor adventures? And then location, so geographical location. Are you in the Midwest? Are you in Ohio? Are you in California? And then we use that to try and separate these different groups. So you can do that a number of different ways, actually. You can use a supervised approach, like classification, or you can use an unsupervised, like clustering. So pretend that we had some sort of oracle that let us know that there were actually two groups, and we tried one of these out, say classification, and we, we got two groups, so we're on the right track, but we had misclassified one of these red Xs. Well, we would reiterate, and hopefully, by making some adjustments, capture the correct groups, or at least a better version. So again, this iterative process, rapid prototyping with regards to data science. All right, so now let's talk about the slippery term, big data. All right, so a couple common definitions. Gartner, basically, if I distill this down for you, they're talking about high volume and or high velocity and or high variety information. So large, coming in fast, and then either coming in from disparate data sources or some sort of nested data. Wikipedia, a little bit more simply, just says data that's so large or complex that traditional techniques completely break down. So I'm going to talk about these guys, which are synonyms here, large data. And then a solution I'm going to show you at the end is going to be able to allow you to handle high velocity data. What am I not going to talk about? This idea of complex data. That's a completely separate issue, and I'm not going to discuss that today. So just to wrap that up, talking about data that's large in size, yes. Coming in fast, not complex. All right, so we have this pyramid here, right? You know, data at different scales. 
So the question is, fundamentally, where do we draw the line? What is big data? It seems like this changes every day. So do we draw it here when we get into mega or gigabytes and above? Do we draw it somewhere here, here, or beyond? So why don't we take a quick poll? Who thinks it's gigabytes and beyond? Raise your hand. One, two, okay, two souls. How about, what's that? I, I ask you though, is that true? So gigabytes plus, we had two brave souls. How about terabytes and above? More people, and then petabytes and above? What if I told you you're all right and wrong? It's a trick question, okay? So what it comes down to, let me define it for you. It's data that is too big to fit in RAM. That's fundamentally what big data is. Oops, wrong way. So let me give you an example. So it could be at the kilobyte scale if you're using Arduino. This particular Arduino, you know, it's only got 256 kilobytes of memory. My laptop here, 16 gigs. I'm at the gigabyte scale. That is a big data problem. So it really all depends. But at this point, you're probably asking yourself, why does it have to fit in RAM in the first place? Any, actually, anybody know before I get there? It's half the equation. All right, so let's talk about it. So if I was looking purely at speed, if you look at your memory hierarchy here, you know, I go from hard drive or solid state, I move up a little bit in speed, I've got RAM, cache, CPU registers. If I wanted purely speed, where would I be? Yes, so that's not the answer. So if we take a look at this in a different way and we look at capacity, you know, how much data can I hold? If you look at the hard drive and solid state, this is where you're gonna have maximum capacity, right? RAM, a little bit less so, maybe on the gigabyte scale, typically. Cache, you're looking at maybe 12 megabytes, and then CPU registers, like half a megabyte, typically, from an order of magnitude perspective. But, again, if you guys are right, if I look at speed, it's the complete opposite relationship. CPU registers, wicked fast, and then I go down the pyramid here, but I also pick up cost. So I can't just have an array of CPU registers that's not gonna be cost effective. So to capture this in a really simplistic diagram, what I can say is cache and registers have great speed, awful capacity. On disk, awesome capacity, but no speed. So RAM, this nice balance of capacity and speed. And that's why this is the sweet spot. This is where we want to be. All right, so a couple common solutions on how to address this problem of big data. Number one, we can, this is probably the most obvious, we can just sample our data. If I can't ingest the whole thing, let me ingest a subset. Couple issues though, right? You know, if I'm gonna sample, how do I know that my sample is representative? Give me, I'll give you an example here. So we've got some sort of cubic function, right? This is reality. But if we take a sample, I just randomly sampled, maybe it's somewhere in the middle, could be somewhere else, it looks linear. So if I build a model on that, I'm gonna be way off. What happens is my data continues to grow. Well, you know, maybe early on when I don't have a lot of data, okay, you know, it might pick up the trends. It might do a good job capturing the signal. But over time, you can see that sample, because my memory is not increasing, my RAM is not increasing, I'm capturing a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall data. So am I really capturing trends or, or uh, signal in that data? Probably not. And it gets worse over time. And then three, how do you capture, how do you quickly capture trends that change over time? So sort of a simplistic view of this would be, you know, pretend that we're pushing out some sort of product, it's new to the market, it generates a lot of interest, we see a spike in sales, maybe it's been out for a while, it sort of tails off, and then maybe we introduce a new feature, or a new model, and it jumps up again. And actual, actually a better example is think of stock prices. So this happens very, very quickly. We have massive changes very quickly. So, you know, how do we capture that with sampling? Probably not gonna do that effectively. So summary of the sampling here. You know, you can use sampling to get data to fit into RAM. The pros are, I can use my Pi data stack, so thumbs up there. I don't have to recode anything, so yes, I've got this rapid prototyping happening, but everything comes with a but, right? Cons, you have to make some extremely strong assumptions that really usually don't hold. One, that your 
your sample is representative of the population. Two, you're somehow capturing signal in this mountain of data using a tiny little piece of it. Three, your population is not changing over time. So think stock prices again. Another very common approach is to completely move away from the Pi data stack, or at least portions of it, and use Apache Spark. So Apache Spark can easily be its own talk. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. For our purposes, all you need to know is that it takes the data that's too big to fit in a RAM and breaks it into chunks. So each one of those chunks can be fed into memory, processed, then pushed out, and, pro and then you process the next one, and so on. So we get to use all the data, that's great. Summary. So what are the pros here? You can continue using Python. Uh, Spark is built in Scala, so it's not native to Python, but we can still use Python via the PySpark API. We can use all the data for modeling, so this addresses some of the issues that we saw with sampling. So that's awesome, that's great. What are the cons? You have to say goodbye to scikit-learn. You have to completely change your machine learning library. So if you've done a lot of work, maybe you've put in a month, or even a couple of weeks of code and work, and you know, you've you spun up a, a number of Jupyter notebooks, and you feel comfortable with your models, too bad, you have to start all over. You have to switch from, say, scikit-learn to Spark MLlib. And it's not a one-for-one -one translation. So there's a lot of scikit-learn algorithms not included in MLlib. MLlib is pretty feature-rich, but not to the extent that scikit-learn is. And of course, you know, you have this learning curve. So if you're in the middle of your project, you're coming up to a deadline, I need to push a model out into production. Oh wait, time out guys, I need to revamp for the next two months and redo everything I just did. Not so great to tell your manager, right? All right, so a big problem here. It addresses all the issues that we saw with sampling, but it kills our rapid prototyping process. All right, so here's the big question, right? What if there was a way to take our Pi data stack and somehow get the same capabilities we saw with Apache Spark? That'd be awesome. Who wouldn't be for that? Guess what? There's a way. That's why I'm here today. So enter Dask in combination with Scikit-Learn. So these are both Python tools. They're both native to Python. They both work really nicely together, and they provide some really cool capabilities uh, only some of which I'm going to talk about today. But if you have never seen Dask before, if it's new to you, you should definitely go home immediately and read about it because it's a really powerful tool. All right, so I'm going to give you a high-level overview of what's going to happen. So imagine this rectangular box here is the Pi data stack. So again, I'm going to start out with data. It's too big for RAM. I need to split it up into these chunks so each one of those chunks can fit into RAM. And then I'm going to push it into a model. So what's happening? On the left-hand side here, all of this is being controlled by Dask. So Dask is going to split up the, the data into chunks. It's going to control the flow of these chunks in and out of our, our modeling piece. And of course, the modeling, all the machine learning heavy lifting is being done by scikit-learn. So I can actually put these two pieces together, and they can work as one. All right, so a little bit more detail about what's happening. Just gave you a high-level overview. Let's go down a level. So we split our data, just like we did before. We instantiate our model. You know, this is going to be some sort of uh, stochastic gradient descent regressor or classifier. More on that later. I'm going to, Dask is going to push the first chunk into the model. The model is going to update. It's now going to be a better model. So I'm feeding it training data. And if we were to zoom in on this particular piece, we can see what's happening. So if I have training data, uh, because I'm doing this stochastically, what I'm doing is I'm feeding in one observation at a time. So the whole point of this, if you're familiar with gradient descent, instead of doing batch where I feed in the whole partition and then update the weights once, I can do this very quickly. I can update the weights after every observation. So I converge much more quickly onto what the weights actually should be. So I push the first observation into the model. The model updates by using the gradient. It adjusts the weights, and then it gets pushed back out. And then the second observation comes into the model. We make updates because of our gradient, and then it pushes back out. And we continue that process until we've exhausted all of the observations. Now, I should probably mention that this is called, if you're familiar with online learning or stochastic gradient descent, this is a single pass. This only happens one time. You could definitely have this happen multiple times. What you would want to do is just shuffle all these. You wouldn't want to send them in in the exact same way that you did before. Otherwise, you'll run into some 
some localization issues. All right, so we've read through chunk number one, we've updated our model, Dask pulls that chunk out, feeds in chunk number two, the exact same process happens. So our model updates, and then chunk number two is taken back, chunk number three goes in, the model updates, and so on. All right, so the big question, how do we actually implement this? So you've seen theoretically how it works. So here we go. Uh, for the Pandas users out there, the beautiful thing is that Dask is actually built on top of Pandas. So all the calls are virtually exactly the same. All I do is I call dask.dataframe. And then you know here I'm reading in with HDF5. Um, you don't have to use HDF5. I happen to like it because of its on-the-fly compression capabilities, you know, specifically with BLOSK, if you're familiar with, with compression. Um, but you can use CSVs, you can use parquet file formats, SQL table, or B calls. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, here we've got, on the top we have Dask, on the bottom we have uh, scikit-learn, so we've got SGD classifier, SGD regressor, these are gonna be what are called online learning algorithms. Uh, the model is a number of parameters, there's way more than what I have listed here, but these are some of the, the key ones that you should be aware of. Of course, we have to provide some sort of loss function some sort of way for the model to know is it moving in the right direction? You know, what is it that we're chasing? Penalty is regularization, whether you want it or not, and which flavor. The learning rate, this is think of step size, for those of you who are familiar with gradient descent. Uh, power T, I should probably explain this to you. This might be new to some of you. Think of power T as um, how you learn. For example, if power T was one, this would, be, this would work great on an IID data set. In other words, if you were playing a game like checkers where the rules never change, this works really well. You'd want a, a power T of one. So very quickly you can figure out the rules and then it can essentially stop learning. Power T of zero would be I'm playing against an adversary that's constantly changing the rules. So I have to be very adaptive to what, what's happening in the world. Um, power T of 0.5 is a great balance because uh, you don't want to be overly eager from a, a modeling perspective and chase noise but you still want to be adaptive to changes and trends. All right, so there's a number of loss functions. I haven't listed them all here for you, but some of the key ones say you want to do classification. You can do on the fly linear SVM. You can do logistic regression. So you can use hinge, squared hinge, log loss. Of course, if you want to do regression, there's good old OLS. You can use Huber loss. This is a sort of a robust version of mean squared error. Uh, it, it's much better about not chasing outliers. And then, of course, epsilon incentive, you want to do support vector machine regression. So like I said, you know, uh, reference the docs for, there's even more functions than this, but these are the key ones you should be aware of. Some regularization options. Obviously, if you don't want regularization, you can just set that to none. L1, if you want, typically it leads to sparse models. Um, L2 or elastic net. Elastic net is just some combination of L1 and L2, some proportionality, which I can set with this L1 ratio. And then alpha is my regularization string. All right, so we've talked about a lot of um, concepts at this point, but let's motivate with a real example. I'll show you real code and output. So has anybody worked with the Higgs data set before, just out of curiosity? Nobody? Okay. Um, who's familiar with the UCI machine learning repo? Okay, just a few hands. Well, this is an excellent resource if you want to find some curated data sets, kind of like Kaggle, but just, you know, I want to try out some classification algorithms. I want to try some clustering. Um, there's a, a whole host of, of data sets for, for the taking that you can work on. Um, so I, I chose this one called Higgs. It's, it's pretty famous. Uh, a little bit about the details. So it's got 28 features. The first 21 are just sensor measurements. And then the remaining seven are just, um, Think feature engineering, derivative features that are help are designed to help you discriminate between the two classes. And this is a, a binary classification problem, just saying, okay, you know, zero would be the sensors are just picking up noise. One is something interesting actually happened. So for the purposes of this talk, just to keep it brief, uh, I'm not going to go through the entire data science pipeline, show you EDA and splitting into training and test sets. Just know that the, the data has been split already. And the training set has 8.8 .8 million examples. The test set has 2.2 million, just for reference. All right, so let's go ahead and get our data. 
So we import DAS data frame, and then we just pull out our train and test set. You may have noticed here that I have the exact same file, Higgs data .h5. What's cool about HDF5, if you haven't used it before, it kind of, you call it kind of like using a dictionary where you provide a key and I can have data sets all within one master data set. It's really cool. All right, so I need a couple other key libraries. So I am, because I'm using gradient descent, I need to scale my features. I need to be able to do that on the fly. Um, I import standard scalar. So this is mean of zero unit standard deviation. I, of course, uh, pull in my SGD classifier. And then I'm going to be looking at the log loss on the test set. More on that to come, but I need to, to import that as well. All right, so I need to instantiate my standard scalar object. I create an empty list for log loss. Again, this is just going to tell me at the end of a training, when I send in a chunk, I update my model, I'm going to see how that model predicts on the test set over time just to see what's happening. So we'll, we'll actually see a nice smooth curve. Um, counter zero and total partitions. Um, this just says, okay, when, when you tell DASK, hey, I've got this data set or multiple data sets that are too big to fit into, into RAM, it'll split it up, it'll parse it for you into what are called partitions or chunks. Um, this is just capturing this trained out end partitions. It's just DASK telling you there's 10 or there's 15 or there's nine. So essentially, I'm gonna use this to just keep track of you know, what partition number is it and to show me my progress over time. All right, so we have to instantiate our model. For this particular one, this is logistic regression. You can tell by the loss being log. Uh, I am using elastic net. It's my regularization with an L1 ratio, perfect split. Um, an alpha of 0.01, you know, you can, you can tweak all these things. Um, but I set the random state to 42. Anybody know why I set the random state? Looking at you, Allie. That, that's actually a good answer. That's, I should probably leave it on that one. But, okay. Right. Yeah, repro reproducibility. So, you know, if I run this on my machine and then Allie runs it on his machine, we'll get the exact same answer. So you can imagine, you know, there might be a little bit of shuffling that happens. So we'll get very similar answers, but they might be just a little bit different if we don't set the seed. I like that, though. All right, so let's actually go through um, running through the different partitions now. So simple for loop using range on the number of partitions. All right, so this data set has the features and the target all as part of one data set. I need to split those for those of you who are familiar with scikit-learn, which is pretty much everybody. And then I need to standardize. So I need to use this partial fit function. Has anyone used this before? No? So it's like fit, except that I can do it iteratively. So partial fit. Not all of the algorithms use partial fit. It's a small subset but you can with, uh, with standardization. So I fit on the training set. A little aside here. So a lot of people make this mistake where you take the data set at the beginning and you standardize all the features and then you split into train and test. Don't do that, that's awful practice. What happens is you have information leakage. You really should split first, train on, or, or fit on your training set and then use that to transform your test set. That's the proper way to do it. So here I'm fitting on the training set. And then let me explain this. There's a little bit going on here. So notice that I'm actually transforming the training set here within this partial fit call. I have to provide, you know, what are the, what's the ground truth? You know, what is the actual targets? And then because I'm doing this on the fly, I have to tell the algorithm up front how many classes do I have. So you can imagine if I didn't do this, say my first partition had two of the classes, but there were really three, and then it makes, you know, it updates, and then the next partition comes in, all of a sudden it has three, it's gonna break. So you just have to let it know up front how many, how many classes. So I'm fitting a model on the transform, the standardized training set. I'm also providing it the ground truth and letting it know how many classes to look for. So I've made an update on the first partition. Then what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna use predict Praba on the transformed test set to give me back probabilities. So logistic regression is gonna say, there's say a 70% chance that this is class one versus 30% chance that it's class zero. So that's an actu it's actually a pretty cool thing. A big differentiator between logistic regression and SVMs. SVMs, you just get class back, you don't get probabilities. So something to keep in mind. Um, has anyone used log loss before? I guess maybe I shouldn't gloss over that. 
So, okay, so maybe I'll explain log loss to you a little bit. So you're all familiar with accuracy. You know, like did I get the class right or wrong? This uh, log loss is a, a better measurement. Your algorithm has to output probabilities, but essentially what it says is um, how your algorithm is going to say the probability of this class. It's going to look at is it correct? Is it you know skewing in the right direction? And how confident is your model? And it's going to uh, penalize it depending on, on how it does. So if it's very confident it's the wrong class, it's going to get hammered. And then I just append that to my log loss list. So of course, you know, while I'm while I'm training this, I want to see some printout. Tell me how I'm doing on the test log loss, and then what partition number out of the total are we at right now? And then of course I increment my counter. All right. So here are the results. This is what it's going to spit out. So this is epic one. I'm not going to explain all of these terms to you, but I'll hit on most of them. This t value over here is the number of partition, or sorry, the number of observations in this partition. So remember, the training set had 8.8 .8 million observations. Here it's brought in a million. This is the average log loss on the, on the training set here. You can see the training time was about half a second. And the test log loss, this is, this is crucial to keep in mind, is about 1.75, which is pretty awful. So this is the first partition, not surprising that it hasn't done a very good job yet. Now I bring in the next partition. So the first one is the readout we just saw. The bottom one's what we want to focus on here. You can see that the test log loss has dropped from 1.75 to 1.14, and you can see I have partition one of eight. So I'm moving in the right direction. So I keep doing this, so now I'm on the third partition, and I've dropped below one on the test log loss. So my model's getting better and better over time. So I'll skip to the punchline here. I won't take you through each one. So we get to the eighth partition here. And you can see, note the t value here. So the t value is 800,000. So you can see how Dask split that up. Uh, the test log loss, 0.7. So we dropped a whole point. Now we're getting into a much better range. And this whole thing, the whole training time took just over a minute on 8.8 .8 million examples. Not too shabby. What's that? Like the, the data set? So this data set's not particularly big. It's about a two gigabyte data set. But this whole process can scale to whatever you need. This is on 28 features, right? Yeah, 8.8 .8 million observations. So, no data science presentation would be good without at least one graph. So on the bottom here, let me orient you, the x-axis here is the partition number. So when the model read in that data, it trained, and then how did it do from a test set perspective, looking at log loss? You can see, no surprise, at the beginning, it does a pretty bad job. Over time, everything's moving in the right direction, and we actually start to sort of converge asymptotically towards the eighth partition already. All right, so let's recap what we've talked about here. So we split, or in other words, chunk the data so we can consume all of it. We did that with Dask. We built a model by ingesting one observation at a time, so stochastically with scikit-learn. And then really the crucial piece from a rapid prototyping perspective, all the code, even if we didn't start out using this, maybe we tried random forest and a couple other methods, um, we, can, we don't need to completely change all of the coding that we've done. We essentially just swap out certain pieces. We're still in the Pi data stack. So just minor tweaks. And we did that with a combination of Dask and Scikit-learn. So in other words, if I combine these two, rapid prototyping, continue, check. We're in good shape. All right, so we've gone through a lot of material here today. I just want to step back and just say, OK, where have we come from and where are we now? So we started out with this idea that we want to follow this rapid prototyping process with data science because solving problems in data science is hard. It's, it's almost impossible to get it right the first go. It's a series of trial and error. You know, there, we, there are stock algorithms, stock approaches that we take, and sometimes those work and sometimes they don't. But it's this rapid, iterative process that gets us towards an answer. As we saw, you know, from a scaling perspective, um, usually we start with something small, 
maybe a small data set, a couple of stock algorithms, build on that. But ultimately, we want to ingest larger and larger volumes of data, and we can get bogged down. So if I'm working on my laptop, I get to a point where I've maxed out my RAM. Now what do I do? Do I pivot? Do I use a subset? So too common, what I'm saying are suboptimal solutions, is sampling. We saw the issues associated with that. And then you could pivot to Apache Spark, which is a, an amazing framework. So if you're not familiar with it and you, you start scaling into data, it's a great framework. But again, you know, if we make the assumption that we're trying to stay within the Pi data stack, um, that pivoting is going to cause massive problems. So both come with baggage. And then the, really, the, here's the big key takeaway. So this, this new library Dask in combination with an already familiar scikit-learn gives us um, really powerful tools to find better solutions faster and allows us to tackle problems that before were just completely impossible. So if you want to connect with me, if you have questions, um, you know, you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Twitter at, at, at David Zaganto, email me directly. I've got a bunch of stuff up on GitHub, a bunch of repos. I'm always adding to this. So if you're interested in, in some code that you can rip right from today's talk, check out Out of Core Computation. Just know it's a work in progress. I have a lot of other things in the works, so I'm going to keep adding to it. And I do have a blog. I blog about all things data science, machine learning. Uh, if you're interested in things like online learning, deep learning, um, how to ace a data science interview, check out my blog. And a big shout out to Metis, who gives me time to work on projects like this, supports me coming out to speak to all of you. And of course, thank you, all of you, for being here at the end of the conference on a Sunday, getting out in the afternoon. And uh, that's about it for me. Why don't we open it up for questions? Dimensionality reduction. So dimensionality reduction is a great tool. The one problem you'll run into is if your data set to begin with is too big to get in memory, how do you process it to even do that? So that's one issue. Um, there are other things you can do too. Like say you have a sparse data set. Maybe you're doing NLP, right? And you have you know, bag of words model or something where you have some columns with some ones, but it's mostly zeros. There are some uh, approaches you can use. Uh, you can use like CSR as an algorithm to compress all that information. So you basically just say like, I'm just going to memorize where the ones are, and I don't care about the zeros. So I can compress a big data set into a small one. And sometimes you can use that to actually get your data set into memory. Um, but as far as like once the data is in memory, um, if you use some sort of data compression, um, there, are, there are advantages to doing that, usually processing time, um, sometimes removing noise, because you, know, you don't want your model chasing noise. So it's, it can be a really good approach. Yeah, so the, actually the, the underlying theme between both of them is this idea of gradient descent. So you, as you know, in a, in a neural net, you push your data forward just like we saw in Dask. You know, we push the data in, and then the model updates. You have backpropagation, which is just a fancy term for gradient descent. It could be stochastic or mini-batch, but fundamentally it's just gradient descent. So if anyone's sort of new to machine learning, the best algorithm you can ever learn is gradient descent because it runs pretty much every algorithm except for like the analytic version of linear regression. Did that answer your question? It is the exact same process, yeah. There are, now there are different flavors of gradient descent, like you can have momentum and, and some other things, but from a principal perspective, it's the exact same thing, yeah. Yes? I'm glad you asked that question because there's a whole other side of Dask that I didn't touch on just for time constraints. But Dask allows you to move into distributed environments. Um, it scales to hundreds of machines with thousands of cores. It has this idea of a task scheduler under the hood. It uses DAGs if you're familiar with DAGs. 
So really what it does is it takes the same code that I create on my laptop here and allows me to scale when I'm ready to a cluster. And I can take that exact same code with all my code base, the PyData stack, and now I can do things that Apache Spark does. Yeah, so everything's kept on disk. It partitions it on disk, and then it pulls into memory what it needs, and then it pushes that out, and then brings in the next partition. So you can think of what's happening with these partitions. That partition is really just a pandas data frame. Um, the Dask implementation uses the vast majority of, of pandas calls that you're used to, like group buys and such. There are some operations that are just truly hard to parallelize. Those are going to be the operations that you're going to see. Dask doesn't have those capabilities for obvious reasons. But so basically, anything you do with pandas for the most part, you can do with Dask. About. Um, well, so the main thing you have to remember is that Dask and Apache Spark were designed for two different scenarios. So Apache Spark really, really shines when you have massive data sets. When you get into like petabyte level, even like terabyte level, like it's going to really shine just by the way it breaks down tasks. It breaks them into like these big tasks. Whereas Dask breaks everything down to like really, really little tiny um, tasks, and it's all built natively in Python. So first of all, if you're not a Python developer, you don't need Dask, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, there are trade-offs, of course. You know, depending on, on your, your use case, um, Dask may not be the right thing. But if you're a Python developer and you're familiar with Scikit-Learn and Pandas, um, so unless you're dealing with massive data sets, consider this first. So yeah, that's an area I didn't talk about. So there is, there are ways to optimize. Um, like for example, like if you use HDFS, Hadoop, typically what it does is it breaks it down into like 128 megabyte chunks. Uh, that may or may not be useful for you. Dask, uh, I think, I don't quote me on this, but I think it breaks it down to like 100 megabyte chunks, somewhere along those lines. You can set that, you can play with those parameters, you can repartition, you can do all these things. Um, that's where. I don't have any good rules of thumb. That's sort of a trial and error process. Maybe somebody knows you know, how to do it, but that starts to move into more like the data engineering realm, which I'm already kind of pushing into the gray area here. I mean, the only limitation is the capacity of your disk and how quickly you need the processing to happen. So again, you can move to a distributed environment to fix the, the capacity issue. But if you're using CPUs, you know, maybe you want to think about GPUs or something. Any other questions? Can I use? SAS as a data set? Yeah. You mean? Yeah, I mean, how, as long as you push the data out in some sort of format that Desk can handle, whether it's a CSV or a SQL table or something along those lines, I don't know if there's a direct connection. There may be. Anything else? I'm not up on Docker Swarm, so I don't know that I can. 
Is is it just are you are you just capturing like are you pushing model? What are you pushing to the to the different nodes? Talking about the data? Yeah, I mean, you could, that's one way to do it. I don't know how that performs against, say, Dask, which does can do the exact same thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I haven't run a performance test on that. It's, it's an interesting concept. Any? Okay, shoot. So you're talking about like one hot encoding? Yeah, exactly. Does my research I already have some. Um Dask has an indication for that kind of like one hot and like one potentially can do the real data that I have. I mean it's already I'm not just talking about it like in one hot, but am I gonna put a sub in for this Dask that's like, oh it actually thinks it can talk like one hot? So you're talking about going from say like a long format to a wide format using yeah. Dask and on disk. Um I am trying. I haven't done it yet. I'm trying to think if there's any reason why you wouldn't be able to do that. Um, I don't think there would be any reason why you couldn't do it. The only thing is, you it might be a slow process. Yeah. No, it's a great question. These are all great questions. Yeah. Um, it, it kind of depends how you read it in. So like I used HDF5, which has its own chunking operation under the hood. Uh, if you read in like a CSV or you read in a parquet file or something, you can actually set like the number of chunks you want. Or I think there might be some other parameters where you set the size that you want to pull in. But yeah, you're, we're starting to stretch into the limits of my knowledge for sure. Yes. Yeah, you can. You, there's a repartition function, and you can do that. It's an. Ex, I believe it's an expensive operation, but it's it's definitely a capability. Anything else? Okay, I think. Thanks, everyone.